Today, we're going to have on a return guest, Dr. Lewis Gordon. Dr. Lewis Gordon is the head of the philosophy department at UConn, and he is the master of many different areas of study, all in pursuit of two main questions. And those two questions are, what is the nature of reality? And how do human beings evade the nature of that reality? Uh, the previous episode, when I had Dr. Gordon on, was about decolonization, which is very much attaches to that evasion of reality. And today's episode is also like that. Uh, <laughs> I think that Dr. Gordon and I have a lot of uh, rapport, so uh, doing a little bit of a different intro here because we just launched right into discussion without doing an intro. And so uh, you'll join us mid-conversation talking about his new book, Fear of Black Consciousness. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy the discussion. Is it um, Dr. Kehinde? I'm probably saying his name wrong. Yeah, Kehinde uh, Andrews. Kehinde Ander Andrews, yes. Uh, but I saw uh, your uh, webinar with him, and uh, now that I've read your book, <laughs> I'm like, of course I see Fanon in the background, right? <laughs> I like I, I, a lot. Of, a lot of the choices are, are making sense. Um, <coughs> Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, I'm not a huge fan. I don't want to do the gotcha thing. Um, I do want to mention the podcast that I'm a, a devout Christian, not uh, what, because what's I'm wrong with that. Nothing. Oh, nothing. Good. <laughs> uh, yeah. Like, no, no. Like the reason I want to mention it is um, just uh, what I don't want to do is I don't want to be disingenuous. Mm hmm. Right, and so that, it, and maybe it won't need to come up in the podcast, and that would be fine. Uh, just that, yeah, I know there's a critique, and I think a rightful critique of many forms of Christianity. And so, what I don't want for my listeners is they know that I'm a devout Christian, and for that to be uh, me hiding hiding that while I'm talking to you, if that makes sense. That totally makes sense. You don't have to hide yeah. that. Right, yeah. right, and I, I don't feel well. That's, I, but what I didn't want is to follow up like you talking about the critique of Christianity and me be like, I'm a devout Christian. And then, you know, like there's that whole, you know what I'm talking about? There's yeah. that whole apologetics thing that to be quite frank was more interesting when I was 16. So, <laughs> but it's also, <laughs> if that makes but sense. Christianity is a very interesting example though, because if, you know, I make a distinction between mm. Constantinian Christianity and what preceded mm. it. And right. a lot of people don't realize that, that, um, for instance, a lot of people don't know in the early period of Christianity, uh, a lot of the people who were very active and proselytizing were female. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and that um, Constantinian Christianity imposed a form of patriarchal structure. Mm. And, and, and that's one of the reasons why he commissioned, I forgot the name of the librarian in Palestine, to, um, to assemble a canonical set of texts, which actually then pushed away the women writers. And mm. uh, but a lot of people don't know that Christianity is a far more complex phenomenon. And uh, oh yeah, and in the, and in the book I also make a distinction between um, the more ancient uh, African um, Eastern going Christianity and right. what happened that split the Mediterranean to create a form of Northern Christianity that's mediated by Aristotelianism. But uh, as you probably know, I I was also a professor of religion, not not only philosophy and other things. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's no, cool. I've trained scholars for PhDs in religion. <laughs> and uh, that's why... Every time, every time I talk to you, it's like you've lived an entire past life that, like, you're like, oh, I was also a jazz musician. <laughs> no, no, one of the funny things about really me is I'm a professor of many things. I've uh, yeah. professor of school in dance, phenomenology of movement. Uh, prof mm. I, I've done, trained people in from community health issues. I've actually uh, um, trained, trained and advised psychologists. Uh, yeah. work in psychoanalysis. Uh, mm. It's a broad range of things. And in philosophy, that's one of the reasons why I say philosophy of human sciences, to give yeah. it a, a, a better understanding. But yeah, no. Um, so the, the problem is, one of the, you know, one of the, the things about, I like the fact that we started talking about Christianity, because I remember many years ago, when I was teaching, I was giving um, a, some, a course in the Bible Belt, and so yeah. you figure if you're in the Bible Belt, you know, like in my book where I bring up examples from films and so forth, if mm. you're going to be in an audience that are, you know, Christians and it's the Bible Belt, I thought, let me use biblical examples so we could speak. And to my chagrin, to my shock, to my horror, 
None of the students read the Bible. Oh, the biblical literacy is shocking for the Bible Belt. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you could imagine what the, the look at it. That's why to this day, even yes. even when I'm teaching philosophy classes that are not philosophy of religion, I actually yeah. uh, assign biblical passages right. because they need to be li- they need to be literate. They need to know. Yeah. So, like even my social ethics class, which is a large mega class. Mm. I assign uh, Genesis 1 and 2, and I assign the Quranic version, mm. and I also assign the Tanakh version, which mm-hmm. is the, you know, the Hebrew, I don't like the word Hebrew Bible, but the, the you know, the, the Torah. Yes. And, um, and the students are, it's shocking, even to this day, when I'm in an audience of like 300 or 500 students, many of them, including the ones who are Muslims, or the ones mm-hmm. who are Christians, and, you know, and the many who are Jews don't know these stories. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's the first time they're getting to read them. So one of the things I um, do is to to introduce them to that and to the complexity of it, because mm. a lot of them don't understand at this point that if they don't learn to think for themselves and read these things, these texts, yeah. then they're going to be, in, if they're Christians, say, who go to church on a Sunday having some preacher tell them things mm. that are literally not in the text. Oh, d- mm. yeah. I mean, I grew up uh, independent, fundamental Baptist, mm-hmm. and I have moved quite a distance since then. And, uh, oh, man, the amount of misinformation is astonishing. It's astonishing. And- you were probably just <laughs> so shocked when you read, we were reading these things. Oh, my, what? Oh, yeah. Oh, I mean, <laughs> rock music kills plants and God is a God of life. So rock music is wrong. Mm-hmm. I mean, that was a common argument. Um, that's one of my favorites, though, because it just <laughs> it's, it's so it's so foreign to people. Right. Like it doesn't even make sense. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, that's uh, that, that continual movement um, is is part of what's led to the, this podcast for me. Right. Like that this search in philosophy and in religion. Um, and it's also been a big part of uh, why embodying different modes of knowing is important for me, because literally what started most of this was my love of literature. Mm-hmm. And I, I was looking at what I was experiencing literature and the wonder and the the fantastic nature of it. And I was just um, I, it wasn't adding up <laughs> to what I was experiencing. Yeah. And, you, and you know what else that's really striking? There's this false mm-hmm. There are a lot. There are a lot of loaded questions, fallacies of false dilemmas, etc., that are right. posed upon looking at the relationship of philosophy to religion, as an example. Yeah, and mm-hmm. it has led to. Uh, so, for instance, many there are many people who study philosophy today who really think they're doing some kind of science when they're doing pseudoscience. And but but here's the part that's really that's right, striking. Mm-hmm. Many of them make judgments around theology and philosophy, I'm not theology and religion, but mm. they have not read the text themselves. So it's yeah. hilarious when I look, read the works of many so avowedly secular philosophers, and it's, mm. they have no idea how much religion is informing what they think. Yeah. And a, a good example is if you think and say, for instance, Le, you know, Leviathan is, 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 you know, connected to this, yeah. this meeting. Sure. And, Mo- many uh, Euro modern Anglo political philosophers mm-hmm. imagine that they're completely, in their thought, independent of theology. Okay, so so what they do in order to 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 maintain this is mm. often mistranslate, if it's in another language, what is clearly a theological or religious concept. Okay, in yeah. order to make it fit. So here, so I'll give you two examples. The first, yeah, yeah. The, the first example is, let's start with in English, right? Because this is mm-hmm. very easy. This is not a, a, a term. If you look at a lot of political, philosophical arguments and how, let's pick somebody like, say, John Rawls, right? Because okay. he's, a, he, he's the most famous American, uh, you know, Anglo political philosopher, right? Uh, The late John Rawls. If you look at his argument in a theory of justice, Mm -hmm. he argues that the the justice has to be in the deep structure of the society. 
Okay? And then he draws out the principles from those deep structures, and then he ultimately then argues, this is how you make the society just in relation mm. to those principles. Mm -hmm. Okay? So that doesn't seem religious at all. Okay? <laughs> On, I, I, I'm curious where you're going with this, but I have some suspicions. Go ahead. That's clearly theodicy. Hmm. If you think about the classic theodician argument, mm -hmm. right? God is intrinsically good. Hmm. So evil is that which contradicts God, injustice, those things, right? Theodike, God's yeah. justice. So what you have to do is draw out God's justice mm -hmm. and eliminate the contradictions. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, right. It's like... Yeah, and it's the embedding it in the um, kind of, I think you mentioned this with Carl Jaspers in your book, um, which for our listeners, that's today we're here to talk about Fear of Black Consciousness, which yeah. was a tremendous read. Um, really, in many ways, my favorite type of philosophy. Uh, enjoyable to read and uh, very challenging, uh, provoked a lot of thought. So thank you. Uh, oh, I appreciate the work you. you put into this. Um, but... <laughs> Um, sorry, I got caught up in that. The, uh, oh, you talked about Carl Jaspers and, and how, you know, atheists might be uncomfortable with his discussion, but the fact that we have to be responsible beyond ourselves, like there's that, that correlation of like, you have to base it in something. Uh, and that as human beings, we're too small in many ways to, to not have that responsibility outside ourselves. If that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. When we talk about Jaspers, uh, you know, um, I talk about the, for instance, his four characterizations of responsibility. Yeah. But, but, but very quickly before I go to Jaspers, the, the second example I was going to use. Oh, was, yes. Absolutely. Was, was Aristotle. Mm -hmm. If you look at a lot of Anglo translations, because it's done by philosophers of Aristotle, uh, when they talk about his ethics, they will talk about eudaimonia. And, mm -hmm. and, and it's often translated as happiness. Right. Which is absolutely ridiculous. Is it but, blessedness? That's a better translation. Yes. It's it's it's, um, it, it's similar to uh, the Beatitudes. Correct. Right? Isn't it, it's the same word. And so if you think about it, a lot of Aristotle would suddenly make sense because there are times when you look at a person who has developed good character, all mm. the virtues, mm. you look at a person and you say, man, you're blessed. Yeah. But but because they want to eschew religious terminology, right. you don't say, wow, you got all the virtues. You're happy. You're happy. <laughs> <laughs> because that, 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 that makes no sense. Because no, there it really time, doesn't. There are times virtue is not about being happy. It's about mm. understanding. There are times it's right. correct, actually, not to be happy, but to be sad. There are times where it's it's proper to be outraged. There are times where it's proper to be quite concerned about the plight of our planet and humankind. That mm. is what a good person is. And it's also some, and then there are people who have uh, criticized Aristotle about talking about the importance of being born and raised by loving good families. They're like, that's unfair. Mm. What if you don't have that? But that's the whole point. If you have it, you're blessed. You're blessed. Yeah. yeah, yeah <laughs> you know, yeah. so, so, you know, so these are things that you notice in the book. I'm not afraid of the religious language. I actually yeah. interrogate I them. And, and so, yeah, that's that. So if we go to Jaspers, one of the things, Jaspers mm -hmm. is very similar. I, you could tell in this book, this is not a, um, a, a epistemologically um, apartheid or segregated book. I, I don't reduce reality and thought to good guys, bad guys. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's about what humanity struggling to understand our condition have, has to offer. Mm. And one of the beautiful things about Jaspers, you could probably tell he's a person I have high regard for. Because, you know, he was a, he was a Protestant German um, who was married to a Jewish German. Hmm. Uh, he studied psychiatry. He, he wrote one of the greatest psychiatry books ever. Uh, his book on psychopathology was influential for more than a century. Wow. He, um, I didn't realize that. Oh, yeah. He was a physician. Hmm. And then he, but he loved philosophy. And when he decided, because in a German system, it, it, that book, was the habilitation, which meant he could be a professor of medicine. He decided he's going to write a book on philosophy. And 
the the professional philosophers ridicule them. They're like, what are you doing? You're moving in our turf. There are even graduate students who go to his classes and say, this man doesn't know what he's talking about. But Jaspers, you know, he's a psychiatrist. He pays attention. But yeah. he wrote, and he writes a three-volume text called, get this, Philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> what are the classics in philosophy, right? Yeah. It's like yeah. base, as the hip-hop people would say. <laughs> and becomes a mega big professor of philosophy, right? Against, yeah. Against his critics. But the thing about Jaspers is he also respected hmm. uh, religious ideas. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that Jaspers um, does, because, you know, there are certain terms that don't work in the German language. Mm. It's very, because existence is, is a Latin term. You, you know, German, uh, and existence and being are not the same thing. In German, you say right. sein. So right. he had to use a neologism, existenz, with a Z, to capture, to talk about a human being. Because you've heard me talk before that a human being is not a thing. A human being right. stands out as an activity. So when he's talking about human beings, he's talking about existence. Mm -hmm. So along the way, but Jasper is, of course, he's a very courageous man because mm -hmm. when, as things were happening in Nazi Germany, uh, he he refused not to teach Jewish students. In other words, he continued to teach Jewish students, anybody else who would come to work with him. Mm. He stood up to the Nazis. He was being attacked. But it's just that he's such a famous philosopher. They were trying to look good, not... Right. Taking him out and killing him. Right. But he and his wife had made a decision because it really did look like Germany was going to win the war at one point. A lot of people don't realize this. Yeah. Um, that they picked a date because he was a physician where he and his wife were going to commit suicide in Germany, in Berlin. But oh, it's, wow. just, it's just that the Allies marched in a, a few days before and it changed everything. Huh. And so, but, but he was adamantly against the idea of fleeing. Mm. He wanted to actually take the position he had a certain view about the obligations to your country if you actually mm -hmm. love it All and right so jasper is after the war uh because people like heidegger look pretty bad which is really terrible the way uh the, in the u.s academy they just valorize heidegger uh, heidegger was a <laughs> schmuck he was an absolute schmuck and he was a coward <laughs> But um, <laughs> but if we look at Jaspers, whom they pretty much have written out of literature, whom I consider mm. a far better philosopher, far more, mm. not just that I admire him as a courageous human being, but his creativity, yeah. his breath. Uh, but Jaspers um, basically said, look, uh, he, he gives these lectures because he was interested to rebuild the German university. Mm. Okay. And, and he says there's a problem, of course, because the German university is dominated by Nazism, right? National Socialism. Mm -hmm. And uh, and as he was, so he gave a series of lectures, and that's what I was talking about, where he was mm. saying, look, okay, look, first of all, Germany is a vanquished country, right? And the, given the behavior of Germany in World War II and the events leading up to it, there is a serious issue that the people of Germany faced, which is the people who have defeated them at the moment, has to assess that society on the basis of its behavior. Mm. This is something that you, people in the United States face as well, mm -hmm. right? Because, you know, we, you know if, if we behave in a way that if we were vanquished and people looked at our record, have we behaved in a way that would make those people say, we deserve mercy? Right. That's the question he was dealing with. That's a serious question to talk oh, about. Oh, yeah, especially at that time, yeah. At it makes so much time. more sense in context, yeah. So that's what it was. And so he says, well, to understand it, you need to understand the kind of responsibilities people bear in a society. And so he started with the first one with metaphysical responsibility. And that's, mm. the, that's the most radically personal. That is the responsibility you have in your relationship to God Mm -hmm. Or if you are in a society where your religion is not God, say mm -hmm. if you're, it's Buddhism, right, mm -hmm. uh, or Zen Buddhism, your re real, your responsibility to the sacred, right? Okay, right. But that's ultimately about you and that relationship. Mm -hmm. Then there's another responsibility: the responsibility you have to your fellow human being, which is moral responsibility. But it's still pretty much about how you act. Okay, it's just that instead of thinking about the absolute relationship to reality, 
It's about your fellow human being. Mm. And then there's a third, which is the obligations you have to law, to, to the legal system. So you may not think, you may think certain laws are really stupid, but you'll follow them as a good citizen. And then there's right. some that you may say are wrong. And right. That's where you have civil disobedience. You defy them. You know, that's where right. you're in the Martin Luther King category, you know, of, of yes. being a good human being requires being disobedient to the law. Okay. Would you say that that third one, uh, that civil disobedience should stem from the first two responsibilities, right? We don't just break the law because we don't like something, but because it interferes with those first two responsibilities. Is that a, a well, this good is way where, to think about it? Well, it's getting further. He's getting more. There's more. Because yeah. you see, the thing about Jasper is, is, and one of the things I love about him, he's not a reductionistic thinker. You know, some mm -hmm. people say it's this versus that. But right. you notice already we're in three categories. So it's not that yes. simple. And you know, every human being is going to manifest each of them. So then he gets to the fourth. And the fourth mm -hmm. is rather interesting. The yes. fourth, he says, is political responsibility. You see, and political responsibility, he argues, is um, a responsibility that a, an entire society bears by virtue of its membership in that society, right? Everybody in that society bears. Mm -hmm. The reason for that one, excuse me, the reason for that one is because of the situation they were in. When you commit harms mm. as a society, right. the entire society is responsible. You can't say, well, I didn't vote for him. I didn't do it. Right. You know, I mean, <laughs> when the allies and all of them were there, it was Germany yeah. under trial. Right. That was his right. point. So, yes, in relation to your question, all of these come into play. Mm. You see, all of them come into play. But the thing about it is that political responsibility, Jaspers points out, is a situation in which um, the um, because the ent entire society is held responsible, mm. say, for instance, the United States is, mm. is held accountable and vanquished and is being held accountable for, for lots of damages done to the rest of the world. Right? Mm -hmm. Just to say yeah. as an example. It means that's, that, say, the United States has to pay a sum. Let's just use it in a, that sense. At the end of the day, where the hell is that money going to come from? It's going to come from the taxpayers. Right. Oh, correct. And yeah. that's the point. Implicit in living in a society is an obligation to take on its debts. And here's the mm. point. It's irrelevant if you are a legal citizen, a permanent resident, even if you're an undocumented worker, mm -hmm. you're in that society, your labor and whatever taxes or resources brought from it are going to be drawn upon. And that's mm. why, um, and so Jaspers basically says, this is why a country has an obligation to ask itself, not only is it doing the right thing, but is it doing it in such a way that if others were to be judging that country, mm -hmm. that they could say they tried their best and they deserve mercy. Right. And that's a complicated issue. And this is, uh, you could probably guess where I was going with this, because it, 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 it gets into the stupid argument people always bring up when you talk about reparations in the United States. They think it's like about individual white people getting up and giving money to individual black people. It's, it's the <laughs> stupidest caricature of the whole thing. Because, first of all, black people pay taxes. Native Americans <laughs> pay taxes. Pay taxes. Um, you know what I mean? And it's not just right. the taxes. Lots yeah. of other things. It's about right. the citizens. It's about the people of a society mm. taking on responsibility for its debts. And that's yeah. what Jaspers was saying. That's when right. you now come political. The, you can right. go in a courtroom and deal with civil suits, an individual who's dealing with mm -hmm. another individual. You mm -hmm. could have a, a, a cop may pull you over, say, you know, if it's a non-racist situation and say, look, you are breaking the speed limit. Here is your ticket. If mm -hmm. you can contest it and go to court, that's still an individual. Right. But if systematically 
One is going to have a whole system with sundown laws and ways of blocking people's movement. And their, their tax money is being used against them and everybody to create a society of injustice. <laughs> to fix that, yeah, everybody's responsible. And that's a right. crucial element. Everybody is responsible for it when it's a political think, responsibility. Yes, and I, I think it's just to go alongside. There is a passage where you talk about... Um, this idea of getting moral and political guilt confused, which I think you make earlier on in the book, and then you, you kind of fulfill that in your discussion of Jaspers. Correct. Yes. Correct. Yeah. And, I did, and I found that very helpful. And, um, you, and you do that at several key points in the book, and I, I found it uh, so uh, illuminating and just really helpful, too, <laughs> uh, when you talked about how people won't talk, they only talk about race and bad faith, because I've tried to have conversations about race, and eventually there's just this weird it somehow it always veers off course and i can't figure out why and <laughs> and a lot of it comes down to that people aren't willing to talk about the actual concepts themselves um one that i also was really helpful for me was your analysis of white privilege mm -hmm. and the way that white privilege has been used as a blanket term to cover really two very different kinds of things neither of which we would call privileges right? Yep. And that's rights and license. And that was so helpful because I have found that kind of covering in discussion where it's like, or I'm confused because they're like, oh, it's white privilege to have, so, you know, have food, shelter and safety. And I'm like, oh, it doesn't yeah. feel like, you know what I mean? I'm like, doesn't feel like, you know, you're like, uh, I mean, in, in talking in terms of like um, not being harassed by the police, for instance, like, you know, safety from and like, it doesn't feel like a privilege. right? <laughs> that that feels not... like something you should have, like it should be a right. You're, uh, that's correct. In fact, yeah, people who pick up the book <laughs> didn't see that one coming. Right. They, they presume, <laughs> this is there's a way that black authors sometimes get stereotyped. But um, lot, but a lot. But the truth is, there are a lot of black authors and white authors who are invested mm. in that problematic concept. But yeah, mm. the the bottom line, the issue isn't that white people have those things. The issue is that we have a, a, a system of um, the distribution of resources that blocks a lot of other people from having what every human being should have. Every human yeah. being should have access to education, health care, goods, you know, um, safety, you know, mm. uh, uh, fairness on the legal systems. The list is long, but these are things yes. that everyone should have. But to tell, it's bizarre to tell you, I mean, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to be, <laughs> can you, should you really tell a, a, a white person you shouldn't have that? I mean, that makes no sense. Right. The other thing, too, is it slides into a perverse moralism. Mm. Because if you think about it, it just comes down to saying, okay, for the white person to acknowledge the white privilege. Okay. Then the person says, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm a bad white person. I have a white privilege. And then they yes. go home to a society that stays intact, no change. Yes. That that doesn't resolve. So my criticism... And get to feel morally superior. Yeah, because at least I'm not like <laughs> other whites. Now, yes. Now, the, so I, I find it despicable. Uh, what right. I, what right. I, what, I, I, I hold no punches on that in the book. But um, <laughs> yeah. no, no, you don't. But, but one of the things, there are several things I do point out hmm. that we should bear in mind. You see, this is... There, there are people who want to so individualize a political issue that mm. it creates a kind of narcissism, like they're gods individually who could handle it, which mm. is one of the reasons when we talk about racism, there are many people who take it personally. Because, mm. you know, it's just like if you're talking about sexism, you and I are males. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're, we have seen males who are not interested in the problem of sexism. They just want women to say they're not a sexist male. Right. Th that's narcissism. The, right. Right. So we need something where we deal with a political issue head on. And to do that, we need to have the way Jaspers talked about, but many others, that we need to have something where people can collaboratively do something. Mm. Now, if we pick the license example, the prop the difference between a license and a privilege, this sentence makes no sense. I have the privilege of murdering you. Yeah, <laughs> that makes no sense. I have the privilege of stealing from you, from raping to rape you. You know, it yeah, makes no I mean, sense. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's an incredibly perverse abuse of the word. Correct. However, um, I was speaking j just about a, a few hours ago on, an, on, on a radio program with, uh, with, where the host I, was in the UK. So this mm -hmm. reference was easy to, to spot. You know, it is possible to have a license to do those things. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, The the iconic example is James Bond, the license to kill. Now, it means when we think about it, if we look about, look at the way, and again, in the book, I make a distinction between white supremacy and anti-black racism. Mm -hmm. But, But let's just pick white supremacy. White supremacy basically says if you are white, you can do whatever mm. you want to people who are not white mm. and, and get away with it. That's a license. Yeah. And, and in fact, we know this because there are, you could easily look at the documentary history of lynchings. The right. people who did it pose for the pictures. They send right. postcards. That way, in, the, in the newspaper. Yeah, they right. advertise it. That, and, and so th- it's very easy to go find out who did it, who committed those horrific acts of murder, Mm. And they're fine. They're right. That's yeah. a license. Now, w- oh, they're some, more than fine. They're celebrated, right? They're That's celebrated. the point of putting it in the newspaper, right? Yeah. Now, here's the thing that I, I often bring up. Sometimes when I teach, I ask students, what would you do if I, you were given a license to kill? You can kill anybody you want, and you'll never be punished. What would you do? Oh. And it's very interesting. I mean, I'll be, yeah. uh, no, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go you, ahead. Wouldn't want, you wouldn't like it. I mean... Why would I want to kill anyone, right? Like, ah, like, PJ, <laughs> but you see, PJ, this is the point. You're speaking yeah. now as an ethical person. An <laughs> ethical person would say, right. wait a minute, wait a minute. Even though there are people I may not like, right? I don't think anyone should have this license. Mm. You know, if we think about, for instance, and, and in a way, a kind of dog whistle when Donald Trump was running for president was mm. when he boasted he could shoot someone in the head in Times Square and get away with it. That's a code whistle to people who want license. It's an announcement mm. to join him to, for a, a reclamation of license. Now, mm. now, here's the thing. If you take a position, nobody should have the license, but it was given to you without you asking for it. Mm-hmm. That's different from if somebody says you have a privilege. And the reason it's different is because this is something you can get rid of and maintain your humanity. And here's how. You can say, you know what? I'm going to collaborate with the people who don't have the license and mm-hmm. organize with other people who think nobody should have this license and to, to, and to get rid of a world in which such, having such a license is possible. In other words, you can do political work. Right. What, what's the point of saying we want to do something about racism if people can't work together to get rid of it? But in, right. that, in that other model, you get defined in such a way there's nothing you can do than get rid of you. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, which is, yes. Yeah, go so, ahead. So, no, no. So that's the thing. I mean, you know, I mean, it's different if you want to enjoy a feminist struggle as a male narcissist to say you're a good male. That, that's, a, that's, that's a waste of time. But, but it's different if you say, look. I don't want women to be discriminated against. I don't want my daughter, my mother, my sister. And I also think the idea of constructing me by virtue of my, my, my anatomy as superior to women is a profound injustice mm. to the humanity of them and to me because it constructs mm. me as superior to them. So mm. I want to fight against sexism. You don't have mm-hmm. to thank me. You don't have to say I'm better than other people. I'm joining in a struggle to make sure people are treated with equal dignity and respect. That is... You can do. Right. And that's right. the point. It, mm-hmm. No, yes. I'm sorry. Go ahead, PJ. Yeah. No, no, no. Um, you know, it's really interesting um, because when it becomes super individualized, uh, uh, and this does get valorized in Hollywood, I talked to, I had Dr. Woodley on from the New School, um, and we were talking about, um, uh, she mentioned how racism as like something mean people, when mean people do mean things to other people, Right. And it's it, how do you how do you stop that right? It's like you you have to go out and hunt down the racists, and in a lot of ways, that's kind of what people. And, and it, it, the weird thing is, it creates um, it, it and the, the uh, you know there's this problematic thing where we often remember mass murderers more than their victims because they're they're more interesting, right? Because we've become obsessed with that. Like, I mean, you look at all the shows about serial killers and it's almost the same thing with racists where it's like we become infatuated with people who really should not be listened to. And uh, there is that, um, you know, Foucault talks about 
that double spiral of the more you investigate something, even if that person is something you're investigating, that it it pushes back into you. Yeah, the, if the, that makes sense. Sure. The thing that the thing that many people miss. Okay. If you want to dominate a people, and the way you want to do it is to be using tanks and guns and all that all the time, that's a lot of resources. No, it is. Yes. But if you can create a whole web of beliefs that make them police themselves, that make them believe they're inferior, inferior and mm-hmm. make people who would have otherwise fought and joined them in a struggle against their, their dehumanization believe they are superior mm. what you if you do it enough you could make you do something uh, uh, with the effect of making the ongoing mechanism of dehumanization ordinary see mm. the mistake people make and this is part of the problem they want to focus on these fabulous and outrageous cases but they mm-hmm. don't realize that racism is mundane you have to right. you have to make it reach a point almost like the way a fish is in water. Mm -hmm. And I have to remind people that um, if we're talking about racists, not racism, many, most racists are nice people. Hmm. In fact, most racists, in some cases, don't even know they're racist. It's when they encounter a situation that makes them realize they want to maintain a system of the exclusion that they begin to, and they they don't want to be called racist. Right, right. But they are actively involved in the maintenance of racism. And, Mm. you know, it's funny when you think about it, you know, I remember when I was a kid, I used to watch the Andy Griffith show. And Mayberry looks so nice, doesn't it? And it's in the South and the, uh, you know, the sheriff, everybody's goofy and Andy and Opie and... And I thought, you know, it looks so nice, but if I showed up <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I began to realize, yeah, uh, when, when, when people like me are not around, these are very mm. nice people. They treat each other mm. well. And, and in the cases, the condition, if I am around, is that I must somehow function as an exception mm. to their beliefs about black people in general which is the maintenance of that system. So I have to be around in a way that says, I won't change anything. So this is an example of wanting, permitting people to come in as long as they don't change the game. But what if the game is the problem, you Mm. see? And I often put it this way, you know, my issue is not that they're immoral people or racist individuals in the world. My issue is that we've organized a world that puts a a lot of power behind them. Mm. If we disempower that system, if we change things around, then we're freed up to work on better relationships with each other. Mm. Now, the people who are the moralists, for them, that's insufficient. They're more obsessed that racist people exist and they want to, as you said, root them out and find them. Now, the point of the matter is, yo, they're not powerful anymore. They're irrelevant. Mm. There are a lot of people who could hate me. As long as they're, they don't have guns and stuff are coming for me and trying to destroy me, mm. um, they have a right to live. They're human beings. And one of the things we have to have room with, and mm. this might tap into something. It's, it's not exclusively Christian, but it does tap into something uh, that my guess is it's connected to something you uh, love in Christianity. And that First of all, the first premise is that every human being is equal in the eyes of God. Right. The second premise, though, which is a rather interesting one, is that you must let go of your ego and enable to to, to create a situation, right? And it, it, it's a complex one because mm. cause God is the biggest, right? So you got to let go right, of your right. ego to have God. <laughs> You have to let go (laughs) of your ego and to, in doing so, create a condition in which other people can have possibility. Hmm. Now, the moment you say the word possibility, right, it's not that people would at the end of the day change, 
Mm. But there has to be faith in people's capacity to change. Mm. But how could people exemplify that if we don't create the opportunities? You see? So, right. so, so the thing about it then is that even though um, the mundane world may be built upon exclusion, it's going to be very important for us to create opportunities to bring an understanding of that in exclusion to bear and to bring with it uh, resources and mechanisms so people could work together to create a healthier society. And I could give a, a short example of this, uh, a very mundane one, right? But it's a sure. rather striking one. I was speaking with, um, uh, in another interview the other day, with, with somebody who was um, in Indiana. And there was a time when I, I, I taught uh, briefly in Indiana. Right, you mentioned it in the book, yeah. Yeah, and, um, but what I did mention uh, w in the book was this, this story. Um, you see, there are parts, it's, today it's more difficult because everybody has smartphones and access to the Internet. But the time I'm talking about, fewer people had access to the Internet. It was such a big deal, in fact, when you became a professor because you got this thing called an email, you know, it was such a big deal, but most people didn't have that. And in some places, especially if they're very, very strict, and in some cases biblical, there's not even mm -hmm. television. There's not stuff, right? So mm. that you could have certain farm areas where there are people who are legally designated white mm. who never, ever, has never seen a non-white person, ever. Yeah, yeah. And in that world, all they hear about are negative statements on what those people are, the, the non-white people. Now, yeah. what's rather interesting, after a certain while, they do learn about the word racism and racist. Mm -hmm. Now, what's interesting, a lot of those people in this world, a lot of these young people get convinced that they are racist because in that context, they think racism is right. That ultimately, because think about it, if black people are really all these things they hear, yeah. what's wrong with being a racist? So, yeah. so then what happens is they go to a public university. They're suddenly in a place where there are black students walking around. They may even come to a classroom where there's a black professor. Mm -hmm. Now, they've walked into that environment completely convinced they're racist. You got it? Now, what I, what I experienced was that there are some, when they saw that a black professor got up and walked out of the classroom. Mm. But there were others who stayed. And after a while, we talked, we got to know each other. The, a conversation as follows inevitably happens. You know, Professor Gordon, this is the first time I, this is the first, I'm a freshman, it's the first time I've ever even been around black people. And if I could tell you the things that I thought black people were, <laughs> but mm. then, I, so they expected to meet these monsters. Yeah. And they said, but then instead they walked into a place where they were like, uh, there are human beings here. And then they're like, there's, there's a disconnection going on. I'm not supposed to li like you. I'm not supposed to. I'm not, a lot of I'm not supposed to. And you're supposed mm -hmm. to be this way and that way. But none of that is there. What's right. going on? And then they, so you see where I'm going with this. There are some people who are raised racist, but discover they're not racist, not through mm -hmm. a project of not being racist, but to their realization that they lack the capacity to mm. block access to seeing a black person or a Native American as a human being. Mm. And those people end up going through a kind of cosmic shift in how they see the world and do things. And some of those students, for instance, I said, you know, you need to see more of the world. I wrote letters for them to travel abroad. Yeah. All kinds of other things. Some of them write me to this day. I'm talking about, you know, going on 30 years ago. So, yeah. but, but, but my point is, it's not everybody, hmm. right? Some people did leave the room. Yeah. But the point is that when it comes to this, in their world, they hmm. grew up with people who, in every other aspect of life, were nice. In many hmm. places that are racist, there are people who check on their neighbors, may come over and say, 
bring them um, a piece of cake or they go to churches together or, you know, they do, they may, if, if there's a tornado go through, a lot of tornadoes in Indiana. Right. <laughs> they, they join and help them build up the barn or fix the houses. Mm. All those tornadoes that hit Kentucky, yeah, there are a lot of racist people there. But a lot mm. of them were sit, working together trying to rebuild communities. You see what I'm getting at? The humanity of the people mm. can be such that we have to deal with a system that makes it ordinary for them fit to fail to connect with that common humanity. And that's, mm. that's where the political work and the individualized moral work come in. Because if I, as a professor, take the position that any white student who comes into my classroom can, must not be addressed as a human being, as a student, mm. that's, a, that's an unethical professor. I shouldn't be teaching. Mm. I mm. have to see every student who comes into my classroom as a possibility, mm. not as an epistemological closure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, man, I, I just, it's always such a joy to talk to you. And there's so much there. Uh, you know, you, you mentioned, and I think it's come up a couple of times, when you talk about the system, uh, is there, are there other terms that could be used for it? Something that seems to come up a lot are the narratives in place. It, would the system, could we even, would a synonym be a web of narratives? Because it seems like m the majority of it is that, you know, you talk about that web of beliefs, but it's almost a thicker description of it than that, where it's like this whole, how the way that it works. Does that make sense? Sure. Am I tracking with you? Well, the thing to remember is you could probably guess as you read the book, one of the things I con consistently do is to challenge what I call singular readings of human phenomena. Hmm. That it's both and. There are many things at once. So, yeah. for instance, uh, what a system is, is a repeated, uh, a form of repeated practice that in its repetition develops intelligibility. It begins mm. to make sense. It's how people interpret the world. Another way of interpreting that, interpreting that is in structuralism, where they say a structure is a rule that enables other rules that enable things to function. You see? So once we understand that, even though that's a more abstract technical way of putting it, that includes narratives and other things as well. Now, the thing about it is in... Ordinary logic, so to speak, you are able to look at something as logical because it has an order and it's well-formed. The technical mm. term is well-formed formula. In ordinary language, a complete sentence, right? The problem, of course, is that a human being is not really a being. It's not really a complete sentence. A human being, in a present participle sense, is an ongoing activity. Mm which means that human-created phenomena have subsets of completeness, but the overall thing is open. Mm. Why that is important is because when we forget that it's human beings that create, human, create the systems we live in, mm -hmm. we ontologize, we make them fixed and permanent mm. when they actually depend on us to function. Which means yeah. we can do them in a different way. Right, right. Which is all about opening. Your book is, a, is a, a political act because it's opening up possibility. Correct. In fact, when I, the description I had of students is I don't see students as things. Right. I see students as communicative opportunities. And mm. that is ongoing. Or so, the way I usually say to students I work with, I always, every class I teach, I ask, I open with a question, what is a professor? And the students are like, why is this professor asking us what's a professor? So they, you know, and they almost always give an example of a, of a obnoxious dictator or Moses with a tablet. <laughs> and I say, well, I ask them what a student is. And, you know, they say somebody mm -hmm. wants to learn. I said, well, you know, the way I understand myself as a professor is someone mm -hmm. who fell in love with learning and never stopped. In mm -hmm. other words, a lifelong student. And as an advanced student, because I've been doing it a long time, I could tell you as an advanced student, every time I meet a new student, that new student is bringing experiences I may not have had, hmm. which means that that student may have a different orientation or angle on what I'm studying, which means every semester I've taught, I've learned something from a student. 
So yeah. my students realize, oh, wait a minute, they're active. They're not to be passive. Right. And then together, I said, so the classroom is a co-learning experience. And we work together. Now, why do we, what, what happens there? It means they can be critical. We can learn together. And it means the subject is open. And in fact, I even extend that to an existential concept, I mean, understanding of reading. Mm-hmm. My students are always shocked when I say, nobody's ever read a philosophy book. In fact, nobody's ever read a book. And they're like, what are you talking about? I said, no, it, you are reading it. You're in an ongoing relationship with it. Mm-hmm. Even, even short children's books, the things you read when you were six, seven years old, if you pick them right. up today, you're like, huh? I didn't notice that. <laughs> Right. Yeah. This this reading makes you see new things. And I Never said, mind when you learn different versions of the fairy tales you read as a kid. I remember oh, reading. Yeah. I read the complete Grimm's fairy tales, oh. and then you go back and watch like the old Disney, and you're like, "Um, that's not what that means." <laughs> yeah, yeah. In 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 the first edition, oh uh, yeah, uh, the 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 queen was Snow White's biological mother. <laughs> that freaked out audiences. So the Grimm's brothers rewrote it to say the biological mother died, and the queen is and the they... stepmother. But but oh, yeah, man. but 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 my point is that openness. You see, learning is a communicative practice mm. in which in which we learn together. That's the thing, and mm. and we should be sufficiently sufficiently secure about our humanity to be open for that ongoing practice. And it's not that they're not things that we know. We know that H2O is water, but we also know that things that look like water are not necessarily H2O. <laughs> this is true, yes. And someone's experience of water who grew up on the coastline is very different from someone's experience of H2O who grew up in the Midwest. And even in the Midwest, someone who grew up in Indiana versus someone who grew up uh, in Wisconsin near the Great Lakes. Sure. I mean, all very different experiences of H2O. Yeah, I, and, and, and even more, even when we think about oceans. I remember the first time I saw the Pacific Ocean. It mm. bugged me out. <laughs> Be, because, look, when I was a child, you went to the beach, it's all the Atlantic Ocean. And everybody, Atlantic Ocean people, the ocean goes out like that. It, go, it almost goes down, and there's the sun. And mm-hmm. even when I went in, into the Midwest in Chicago and places saw the Great Lakes, it was similar, you know? Yeah. If you go to Washington State, Oregon, California and those, it's weird, but the, the Pacific Ocean goes up and then it goes over to the horizon. And I was like, mm. this is weird. And there are all kinds of things. It's color yeah. and so forth. And, I was, and then at, at that moment, I began to realize... Yo, they're Pacific Ocean people, and they're Atlantic Ocean people. <laughs> <laughs> and I began, you know, and then there, and, and I remember too when I was in 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 in, Afri- in uh, going across Africa. There's the Atlantic part of Africa, and then there's the Indian Ocean part of Africa. The Indian mm. Ocean is so different. But again, mm. these are things. Yeah, yeah. There's salt and there's water and there's blah blah. But it's far more complicated than we realize. And, but even when we study stuff in astronomy, if you look at Europa or Titan and so forth, there are places out there where it looks like an ocean and, you know, beneath the ice in certain places, but that's methane. Mm. And, and a lot of us don't realize, and there are things in physics a lot of us don't realize because we see ourselves as solid, but, you know, relative to something that is much colder than us, we're a gas, we're gaseous. And yeah. something even colder, we're just light. We're just energy. And there are yeah. people who just don't understand it. And then there are other simple things. A simple philosophical exercise on perspective. The way I usually teach what the body is, mm. is to say, you know, a body is basically a location through which you're able to say the word there, here and there. It's a spatial temporal coordinate. Now, the way you live it is different. We see ourselves as fully embodied. So when I go, what I do is I often put a dot, just a little dot with a marker on the on the whiteboard, okay? These mm-hmm. days it's mostly whiteboard. In the past it was blackboard, so I put a, with a chalk a dot, right? And I said, you ever wonder if a dot had a point of view, how we would experience it, imagine it? And of course the dot's point of view would be as a full body, like I am one big dot. <laughs> 
You see? And we don't realize that if you imagine if they, you see a friend, you say bye, and a friend steps in a helicopter. You're mm. both fully embodied. But as that helicopter begins to rise, you get smaller and smaller and smaller. And before you, they even see your hands waving because you're just a dot. And from the, so what you think is just a fixed object is a whole mm. living reality. And the people, and when you look up at them, that little dot that's going away, that's the helicopter, you think it's like a little frozen dot, but it's a whole life going on in there. And this is the thing we're missing when we, when we try to deal with communication, intersubjectivity, embodiment, and all of that. That there, that there is, from a relational ex perspective, a lot going on in lived reality. Yeah, and I love that. And I think that's why I connect so much with uh, the way, one, your philosophical emphases and the way you do philosophy is I think one of the biggest struggles we have as human beings, at least uh, from my own experience, is that we don't realize the fullness and richness uh, of everyone else's internal experience, right? Like we, we look at other people and we see them as this like, Co uh, complex shape uh, constellation of things that we know about them and these identities that we kind of try to box in. And it's like they are experiencing life in the same way that you are. I mean, even to take the, the dumb, uh, sorry, not, the, not that you're, the dot is dumb. You're not, your example is not dumb. But could the, be a, yeah. could be a brilliant yeah. dot. Could be a brilliant yeah, yes. dot. <laughs> <laughs> but the, uh, to take the dot example, that like if you were actually a dot, like what to us as we think of as a circle, no, it would, it would be very important to the dot all the little granule differentiations we, when you do like i mean <laughs> they would probably organize themselves depending on if it, they were slightly square and we wouldn't be able to tell the difference right like if you had a series of dots um and so it's just really um yeah i i, I really appreciate that uh i have a question and this might be because i have a proof copy but i have to i have to ask this for my own curiosity because i almost never get to ask these kind of questions on page 93 um, I laughed about this for 10 minutes, and it's because I enjoy the ambiguity of this. Yeah, this is the, um, the final copy. By the way, since we're talking yes. about copies, I mean, they'll be listening. But this is the Penguin Random House British copy. Oh, but that's some cool. People would, some people, this is, I have to give a shout out to the artist. Her name is Sim, Simi Abe, who did that yeah. one. And I, I love both copies because they're saying so much. And yes. then, so, and then... This is the U.S. copy by Na Kim, a Korean-American artist. And mm. she's saying so much because it's ambiguous, right? Is the black right. rising or slipping, you know? <laughs> but anyway, you were saying page 93. Yes. You say, uh, even an otherwise good bloke, such as the actor Liam Neeson, uh, infamously confessed to wanting to kill random black men. Um, <laughs> I, w why did you use the word bloke? Oh, Pretty straightforward because you know I'm I'm yeah. a global dude. I've been all over the place. <laughs> I have a family in the UK, and I'm also yeah. of Scottish and Irish ancestry. Okay, and yeah, so I wondered. Yeah, I did it on purpose to okay to, yeah. <laughs> to connect to, to Liam Neeson. Yeah. It was the word choice was so unexpected for me that I like I and I couldn't tell if that was you being. Um, and there is a lot of ambiguity, possible ambiguity there. Mm -hmm. uh, if you were being sarcastic with the good bloke. Or if you actually meet, you actually think of him as a good bloke. But Otherwise, me, and I, I used to love yeah. Liam, Liam Neeson. <laughs> that so disappointed me when that happened, you know? Oh, yeah, for sure. And uh, I mean, yeah. and rightfully so. I, the, <laughs> but I, I think it's, be, I, I would have read it as you just being disappointed. Otherwise, you know, if you'd put an otherwise good guy like Liam Neeson. But when you put bloke, I it set my mind into like several different paths of like, is he being sarcastic? Like he's not really a good bloke at all. I mean, obviously not. Like that, but I I got a real kick out of that. So it's not often I get to ask an author <laughs> about those little yeah. uh, those little details. So I enjoyed that. Yeah, um, and, and it also just yeah, it was just more for fun. And also in reading and writing, and there are ways in which we can talk about communities. But also one of the things is um, to to point out. This is to bring out the point about environments. We can have environments that bring out the worst in us and environments that mm. bring out the best in us. Mm. And you could tell my everything, every all of my work, because I'm a really committed person to the concept of freedom, mm. is, is people's capacity for growth.
for change. And I think we're in deep trouble where in a, when we reach a point where um, we don't commit ourselves to creating conditions for change. Right. Well, that's and, what the that's the way people always will always they'll always be like that. Right? Yeah, yeah. It's such a, it's it's a it's a dangerous sentiment. It so. really is. It really is. and and when people are afraid of truth, you see, a lot of people think truth is fixed, but truth is also revealing the capacity for change. Mm. You know, um, you know, it it it's really terrible this effort that's being done in this country right now to suppress truth. The idea, uh, and to use the arm, the, the argument about discomfort. But mm. the fact of the matter is, um, you know, at, at some levels, there are people don't want their children to to know that um, they were not at their best in certain periods of this country's history, very recent mm. periods. But I think the best thing you could teach your children is not to hide the truth from them, but to say, you know what, in revealing the truth to you, I'm demonstrating to you my commitment to change. Those things were wrong. Mm. And I would like us together as a family to learn how to build change. Because, you see, if you keep lying to your children, at some point they're going to have to, like those farm kids in Indiana I talked about, go out to college and so forth. And the, they'll be quite disappointed because the message that's being given in that suppression is the mistaking view that people cannot do otherwise. Mm. And and that message in one's actions is to say to one's children, I cannot change. We cannot change. Mm. But if one acknowledges having done things that today one regrets and say, I would like us to work together to build things of which we can be proud, I think that's the best gift you can give as a parent to your children. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, probably my favorite part of being a parent is having my chil my kids surprise me. Yeah, right? I love it. Like that, that possibility is, I mean, even, and I, that, that love comes through, uh, is your son's name, is it Elijah? Mm -hmm. Yes. When you talk about like his different comedic actions throughout the book, <laughs> you know, I like, and, and I love that, you know, um, uh, my oldest is uh, a little bit of a clown and my youngest is just a clear warrior. You know, like he's, he's so, he surprises me with how aggressive he is. And it's just, and I'm constantly, as much as I even characterize him like that, I'm just constantly surprised. Like I, we, we start to think of someone this way. And the amazing thing about kids is they haven't learned yet the, to put themselves in the boxes we give them. And my, probably my biggest challenge as a parent is to, uh, avoid those boxes as much as I can, right? Like mm -hmm. we, we want to f enforce, you know, certain uh, ways of thinking and then you, you start to look and see what they can become and it's it's really uh, amazing. And I think that's that really speaks to what you talked about. Um, I had to think through this uh, uh, phrase a little bit to understand what you're getting at. To act from commitment uh, defies imitation. Correct. That's... And that, that idea, I don't want my kids to be like me. And that to love is to open up the possibilities of a completely different, but hopefully better world. Well said. Well said. And in fact, I have, I have four children, two boys, two girls. The boys are bookends. And I got to oh, tell you, nice. I'm constantly learning from my children. But you mm. know, there are also these wonderful moments because I bring up different, different, I bring them up in different ways in the book. You know, mm. for instance, my eldest son is where is the one where I bring up with the policeman example. But, right. uh, but the, um, but the, but there are these moments where we surprise our kids, and this is what I mean. There are yes. times because my children are all adults now; they're not kids anymore. They're you know they're in their twenties and thirties, and um, the moments when they visit and they discover that there was something they introduced me to, and and that I love it and I'm doing it, and yes. I've corrected my language on the basis of what they taught me. Mm. They're like, oh wow. Dad does that? I didn't Dad expect Dad changes. That. Yes. And I realized that's, yeah, it's not only what they teach, but when they, what happens to our children when they see our capacity to change and learn? And, mm. and you know, because, I mean, you know, um, I was born in the 60s. 
And, you know, the 60s, and but, you know, and, and I was an adolescent in the 70s, and the 70s was wild, but the, 70, <laughs> but the 70s, the nomenclature, it's not like what we hmm. have. There are things that we saw, but we had no language for. Right. We just didn't. And these mm-hmm. generations are developing language for those things. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, for instance, even when we say words like trans today, in mm-hmm. the 70s, you said transsexual or transvestite. Mm-hmm. But there's this more complicated insight in the term just saying trans that right. connects to things like disciplines and uh, and the openness of relations that people can have. Mm-hmm. And at first, when I just kept hearing trans, I thought that was weird. But then as I looked through it and thought through it, I thought, you know, it makes sense. So I yeah. went and bought a whole bunch of books, started <laughs> studying. And then, I, and then it, in front of me, there are trans students. And yeah. we're working and we're learning and I and and I'm introduced to a world where where it informs me, it makes me grow as a human being and mm. the relationships are enriching. And so, you know, when, when uh, you know, my, one, one of my children publicly identifies as queer, um, you know, says and we're talking and, and, and at that moment, you know, says, wow. Wow, Dad! You know, I I had no idea, but you know, because it's an adult now, and this and yeah, and, because she, you know, didn't see me as um, as uh, phobic or anything like that. Mm. It, it's just instead, it was more trying to say there's this whole language, and I mm. wonder how that would be if Dad thought about that. But yeah. then discovering Dad did think about it, let, yes. and thank her for that, and other people as well. And that's mm. the point. And there are many other things. You know, it's not just about those concepts. There are many things that we could learn, you know, from our from our from our children. But the thing is, we have to be secure enough mm. for our ch- to to in front of our children reveal that we're not all knowing. We're not gods. It's funny. It's what I was talking about today in class. I was teaching Simone de Beauvoir, and she opens mm-hmm. a book. Um, you know. Um, you know, uh, pull, you know, um, the book translated as, you know, for an ethics of ambiguity. Mm. And she opens up with saying, you know, children are in a world where parents are gods because they believe we always have it right. Mm-hmm. And there's a point at which uh, even when they daydream, they hope one day to be those gods. But the reason adolescence is so tumultuous is because they're realizing their parents are not gods. Their parents right. are human beings. And, oh, my God, they realized when they were younger, they mm-hmm. had a kind of security in the belief that their parents were gods because they believed their right. parents could protect them. But mm-hmm. then when they realized their parents are not gods, they're just human beings like everybody else, mm-hmm. means your parents can't really protect you anymore. They mm-hmm. could try, but they, you now face the same limitations as your parents. And for it makes it tumultuous because you're struggling to deal with that responsibility. And mm-hmm. And so there's this moment in which what of discovery right that that what a secure parent would say is i never was a god it's just that i was responsible to do my best to take care of you and protect you and sometimes i failed sometimes i succeed but at the end of the day your ability <laughs> your ability to live in the world as a good human being mm-hmm. brings me joy yeah um, as always, so good. Uh, if I could just ask you to, uh, as we kind of wrap up here, I want to be uh, respectful of your time. Um, obviously people, I think they should read your book, but, uh, let's say, uh, after they read your book, what three books, uh, would you, uh, recommend to dig deeper into, uh, this kind of topic, this idea of political commitment and the opening up of possibility? Well, one, because it's the 70th anniversary of the book, is Franz Fanon's Black Skin, White Mass. Another oh, one, is that, that's why it was on sale. I mean, not that that's why I bought it, but maybe it was. Yeah. <laughs> there's, a book, there's a book I came across that, um, mm. it, it, that uh, it's very insightful. It's by a woman by the name of uh, Gillian Konani. Mm. And... Um, it's called Living While Black. She is a therapist, and she just gets to the point and says some really, really extraordinary things. Mm. And I, I, I do think that's a, 
a beautiful book to read. And there is a book by the, a woman by the name of Nathalie Etoke. Mm. It's called Black Melancholia. It's a mm. mixture of poetry and writing, but she, she, she delves. She's an, a Cameroonian woman who delves. Actually, both of these women are connected to Cameroon, but mm. they're really beautiful explorations. And uh, uh, Etoke's book has a concept called for slash giving. And it's a really insightful thing to, to tap into. Uh, and I wrote the forward to the English edition because mm -hmm. I fell in love with the book. I read it in French before. And what it is, is, you know, a lot, when people have harmed people in a society that's based on contracts, they don't actually mm -hmm. want to be forgiven because if you forgive them, they think they owe you. <laughs> they don't want to owe anybody anything. Mm -hmm. So, but she wanted to create a concept of a different kind of giving where there's a way to move on without a sense of ongoing debt. Mm -hmm. And I'll leave it at that. People should read her book to see, yeah. to see it. And that's Black Melancholia. Yeah, yeah. No, yes. no, it, it, it's, 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 yeah. It, no, 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 it's not Black Melancholia. I say Black, I said the name wrong. I'm sorry about that. It's called Melancholia Africana. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Yeah, Melancholia Africana. Sorry, I said the title wrong, but Melancholia no, Africana. No, absolutely. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Gordon, absolute pleasure. Um, and to our listeners, if you enjoyed the depth of uh, conversation, if you learned something, um, which I can't see how you couldn't have, <laughs> uh, please like, share, and subscribe so someone else can too. Uh, appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate it, PJ. And <clears throat> excuse me for the cough, but to everybody out there, as I said before, be safe, healthy. Mm. Uh, uh, I wish you love. And I know times are difficult, but do find joy. You need to remember your humanity.